Today's Animal Spirits is brought to you by our friends at Y Charts. Michael, one of the charts I've been going to more than any other this year on Y Charts is the U.S. inflation rate. I think they have it going back to like the 1920s, 1910s, and it's all over the place. But the great thing about it is you can take out one period of time and then you can export the data. So you can play around with the data too, which I've done. So I pulled up the 1980s here. Coming off the 1970s, we had double-digit inflation. And then I looked at, okay, what, what happened in the 1980s? How long did it take for inflation to come down? Because Powell last week said, under no circumstances am I going to get off of this 2% target. That's it? No. 2%, that's it. We're staying there. So I wanted to look at, well, how often does, it, does the extra inflation rate in the 1980s, how often did it get there? But below what? 2%. Or Did it two, ever get below 2%? 2 to 3%. Didn't go, it didn't go below 3% until 1983. So that was after peaking in the early, in about 1980. Didn't go below 2% until 1986. It was actually 4% or higher almost 60% of the time. 3% or lower just 14% of the time. Now you could say, well, the Fed's looking at PCE or core or whatever. I don't know. But the, my point is, no one looks at the 1980s as this, as this like inflationary hellscape because the, the inflation rate averaged 5.6% of the 1980s. Is that all because it was high in the early? A little bit, but but I'm saying it was only 3% or lower 14% of the time. So no, but here's the thing. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. As we've discussed ad nauseum, it's not the number, it's the direction. And it was high, but it was falling. But my point is, right now the direction is going in the right way, but the Fed keeps saying we want the number. And I don't know, I don't know if they're lying or they're, but they keep st sticking to this number. And my point is the 19, no one looks back at the 1980s as this awful economic period. Everyone thinks it was like a great time for the economy. And inflation was over 5% on average. So my, my point is that, like, if the Fed is really wedded to this 2% number, uh, maybe they just need to chill out. Just a thought. If you want to look at this inflation chart and more, go to whitecharts.com, tell them Animal Spirit sent you, and get 20% off that initial subscription. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. What a difference a week makes. It is Tuesday at 9.10. Last Tuesday, the stock market was significantly higher than it is today. Market opened up close to 3%. That was the inflation day, correct? It was kind of like, kind of like the roaring 20s. They lasted for like 15 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. So, so, so credit to us because we hedged a little bit, right? We said, listen, if the market closes here, it might roll over. It did roll over. <laughs> it certainly uh, did. When, when, we, when we talked last week uh, – Inflation came in under expectations. The market was flying, and ever since then, it's been downhill. And also, I feel like uh, the next day, when the, or the two days after that, we, we did have a few people say, like, why is the market falling? Which is a rare question to ask us because, uh, you know, usually the market is – I don't want to say the market is going up or down for good reasons, but this was, I thought, like kind of an odd situation. I really don't know why the stock market has declined not, as much as it did over the last week. I don't have a great explanation for it. You're not just going to blame the Fed? Wasn't that the easy case that when the Fed minutes came out, that was it the next day they said, we don't care, we're, we're going to wait until inflation hits 2% and that's it? Yeah, but there was also some stuff in there that suggested that certainly the pace of rate hikes were going to dramatically slow. We're not doing 75 again. I don't know. I, I had all my retirement savings banked on seasonality and that didn't work. So I don't know what to do now. <laughs> well, no, funny. You should mention it. <laughs> now we're entering the strongest period of the year. Oh, so listen, no. we'll check back next week and maybe you'll eat your sarcastic words, you jerk. <laughs> I'm just saying sometimes it's not that, that. The other thing is the other seasonality thing. I guess it's not even seasonality. It's like the presidential cycle. Like once we get the uncertainty out of the way of the elections, then the market can take off. So I guess sometimes it's just not that easy, even though it kind of Well, makes listen, sense. it's not. Yeah, it's not easy when you just make up statistics. You just you you're just making shit up. Listen, you got to give it you got to give it twelve months. The, uh, the data was it was twelve months after, so there's never been a twelve month period. So yeah, I can make stuff up and say it doesn't work either, but that's not hey, what we no, do. No, I'm here. not gonna make stuff. That's last not what week, we do here. La, well, last week we we uh, granule. I feel like you made that word up. Just made it up. Get off it. That is. The <laughs> uh, last week we talked about how often the market is down two years in a row, and I decided to run the numbers. And the, the quants came after me on For Twitter and in my inbox. Uh, okay, so here's the data. Going back to 1928, well, 1928 to, to 2021, and the S&P 500, 91% of the time is not down two years in a row. Right. Right? So that means 9% of the time it is. It's a very low probability. But then people said, well, that, what about conditional probability? Which uh, I guess I haven't heard that term since statistics class in like eighth grade. 
Uh, but the thing was, well, how many times when the stock market down, is it then down the next year? Yeah, that makes right? sense. That, that does which make does sense. make, which was a, yeah. a fair point. All right, so what are the numbers then? Uh, so then, so there's been 26 down years since mm-hmm. 1928. Eight out of the tw- eight out of those 26 years saw a down year the next year, which is All roughly right. a third, 30% of the time, which is essentially the stock market's long-term average. It's up 70 to 75% of the time. So it's up three out of every four years on average. So, All right, so, 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 so basically, if a, the stock market is down one year, it tells you nothing about what's going to happen the next year. That's, I think that's the point. If it's up one year, it tells you nothing about what's happening the next year. Or if it's down one year, it tells you nothing well, why don't, about what's going to happen Why don't we get it out of the way right now? Why don't we get it out of the way right now? Will the stock market be down next year? Forty yes percent no question. Forty percent chance. I don't give yes or no. Forty <laughs> oh, percent chance. On. Come on. Well, don't you think that there's three scenarios? Hard landing, soft landing, no landing. And I feel like you could ascribe a stock market value range to all of those. The hard landing obviously would be down. I'm curious about this no landing thing that you mentioned. What exactly do you mean? I think it would just still be in no man's land where it feels like we're cl- very close to a recession and inflation comes down, but not as much as people want it to. And it's, we're kind of just stuck in the middle in no man's land and people can't tell if we're going to have a soft landing or it's going to be a recession. I think that that would be the no landing situation. I, un- I unfortunately uh, find it very easy to see both sides of the argument of why the stock market should, be up or should it be down. But uh, at the risk of arguing with myself for the next five minutes here about which way it's going to go. And I will, I will pick a side. Let's, let's, let's keep going. Okay. I, the, the good thing is you don't have to pick a side. That's true. The That's stock true. Market's, but for the purpose, but for the purposes of the show and entertainment, I will pick a side. What was the Adam Smith guy's name? What was his real name? George Goodman or something? George Goodman. That the stocks don't know that you own them. The stock market doesn't care if you think it's going to be up or down. It's going to do what it's. But our be. listeners care about being entertained. Come on. True. Try to have some fun here. That's a, that's what I said. Forty percent chance. That's entertaining. Forty percent chance of what? Stock market being down next year. <laughs> you can't go wrong with that prediction. <laughs> All right. That's um, why economists so, do it. All right. You know what? I'm not going to get off it. I'm going to stay on this topic. When we we did a live podcast on Friday with the guys that on the tape, Guy Adami, Dan Nathan, and Danny Moses, and thank you to everyone who came out to support it. We had a great time. We did the podcast. We got drinks after. I had to leave early because I saw Jerry Seinfeld, which I'll t- talk about later. Uh, and it was a great time. It was really a great time. So thank you, everybody. And you know, we I mean, people traveled to see this. People came far and wide. And I guess, it's, you know, New York is a good excuse. You could always find things to do there. But thank you again to everyone who came. Yeah. All right. New so, York in the holidays is amazing. Um, actually, as a New Yorker, not quite. You don't think so? I, well, I, I was in the city yesterday and I, uh, I was like, huh, the, the train station was fairly empty, but the city was bumping. Getting to Penn Station stunk. It was absolutely mobbed. All right. So See, this at, is the problem with you. You can't you can't appreciate stuff anymore if you've been there for a while. It's like living in California, not caring about the weather. Like I go to New York in the holidays, and I think the city is amazing. It's bustling. Uh, yeah, it's lively. People are shopping. There's decorations everywhere. You <laughs> and see New York it all is the like time. get out of get out of my way. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. So so we were talking uh, at at the event, and I I posed a question to the audience: How many of you think we're going into a recession? And 90% of the room, I mean, pretty much everyone raised their hand. How many of you, and then I said, how many of you think the market takes out new lows? Or I can't remember if I phrased it, how many of you think that was the low? I don't raise your hands. I can't remember. But let's just say I said, how many of you think the market takes out new lows? Everyone raised their hand. So I am, I am of this thing that I think earnings will get worse in 2023. I think we probably this excess savings that's been making the numbers not square. I think that does run a little bit dry, uh, and so for that reason, and because the Fed is still talking tough, I don't think it's a big leap to say that the market will be down next year. I have no prediction that you know that it'll be down ten percent, fifteen percent, six percent. I don't know. The funny thing uh, is though that we could go into recession and still not do new lows. Like that's, that's the thing that would get everyone is we go into recession, but the market says, all right, we got the recession. Now I'm taking off. So, so that's the other that thing. That would be is the that, confusing part. Yeah. So, so we've also posed that question. Is it possible that the bear market bottomed before the recession began? And so I could also easily see a scenario where, yeah, we do go into a recession and earnings do fall, but not as much as everybody thought. 
And because most people are expecting something pretty bad, maybe what we get is just mildly bad and, see, see, uh, and it's already baked in. But I, I feel like I feel like that's kind of being a little bit too cute. But here's you know the what thing. I mean? Th- yeah. Th- if you wanted to get cute, though, here's how it, here's the scenario. Things are have already things can obviously get worse, but the the junkiest junk and the highest speculative stuff has already gotten crushed. Yes. So obviously it would be the the rest of the market would have to come down and the stuff that's held up well then would have to fall, roll over. But again, that stuff's are Amazon's down 55% you were telling me yesterday. Yeah, Apple looks terrible. I mean, yeah, a lot all, of these it all big looks, companies looks really bad. have already so, gotten shellacked pretty good. Obviously, again, it can always get worse. Yeah. I guess what I will say is this, to, to, to put an optimistic spin on this. Uh, if you survive this year, you can survive another bad year, right? This is, this is a tough year. Uh, and the good news is that if you're a balanced investor with stocks and bonds, like a lot of our listeners are, the bonds will be much better for you next year, barring something very unforeseen. Well, like if, if we go into a re- recession, it would be hard to see bonds not performing their their old stability thing that they didn't do this year. Yeah, if, if rates go from if the ten year goes from wherever it is, you know, where is it now? Three, I can't remember where it is. Three six, if, whatever it comes down to three, yeah, you're going to get price appreciation on your bonds as well as a decent uh, total return to boot. And then the other thing is that for people that are still contributing to their to their uh, future investment accounts, which is a, a lot of you, this is fantastic. I know it hurts now, but the opportunity to continue to buy stocks lower, and I'm not saying that they can't go lower or that this is like some generational buying opportunity, uh, but this is a good thing. This is a good thing, even though if it might you, not if, feel like it. Yes, yeah, so if your time horizon is measured in years and not days and months, you want another down year. Yeah. If you're yeah. contributing still, if you're still in that saver. Um, okay. Uh, Sam Rowe tweeted, by the way, I saw Sam at the event. Great to see him. He thanked us for our shout outs and I thanked him for his, for his content. Great to see Sam as always. Um, Sam tweeted the depth of recessions are not massively correlated to the scale of the S and P 500 declines. The 1970s and 2001 recessions were very bad for stocks. I'm sorry. 2001 was the mildest recession. So this, this is a uh, work from Deutsche Bank. We'll, we'll throw this chart up here. Basically, um, it's all valuations based on. Valuations are a lot of it. And unfortunately- In the early 70s, you you had the nifty 50 stocks that that all these huge conglomerates and blue chip stocks were trading at nosebleed levels. And even though it was a mild recession, the stock market got crushed. Same thing in 2000. So, and that's the other thing is that, man, risk-free, the risk-free rate is like really stiff competition for for stocks. True, but we get a recession and it goes right back down, right? That's true. Probably. That's this is, this is a lot of on the one hand, on the other hand, but like stocks yes. aren't. You could use. I think stocks are fairly valued. I don't think they're ludicrously valued at all. All of the froth has been more than than cleaned away. But are stocks like a screaming buy? You know, it is just. It is. We had 15 minutes last week of like, ah, this was awesome. Yeah. We're gonna end the year great, and then, <laughs> nope, we got rugged. Yeah, we got rugged. We all got rugged. Bespoke tweeted, the number of 1% declines to end, oh, I messed this up. Wait, to end the week? What does this mean? It says S&P 500 number of 1% declines to end the week. Does that mean on a Friday? I think that would mean on a Friday. Or I guess Thursday if it's closed on a Friday. Okay, Okay. that is an interesting, interesting data poll. I guess guess that's, that's indicative. It's indicative of how people feel, right? People don't want, people just sell on Fridays, like- Get me to cash. And so we've had the most selling to end the week, whether that be a thir- early Thursday, end the week, or Friday, uh, since 1950. Rough. It's been so a, that would, it's been that, a shit That should year. mean like alcohol sales should be high this year. If everyone's selling on Friday, you should be buy- people should be buying more booze. Well, I think, I think my uh, alcohol consumption has at an all-time high this year, fortunately. <laughs> really? Even higher than the pandemic? Uh, actually, no, it can't be. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. My memory is short. But that's yeah. another pandemic chart. That, that was another chart that was ruined by the pandemic, Michael's alcohol consumption. John, make every, a chart of that. Every chart was ruined by the pandemic. <laughs> uh, Apollo is an interesting chart. S&P 500 performance in the 12 months following a Fed pause. And as you would expect, it's good. Like once they do what they have to do and get out of the way or stop uh, Okay, if, if, we're, if we're making predictions for next year and putting probabilities on it, what month does the Fed stop raising rates? Uh, like February is the last month and then it's done. 
I, I'm embarrassed to ask this question out loud. Do they do they do these meetings every month? I don't think so. I think February is the next one, right? Fed. Listen, I'm not embarrassed to admit it. Uh, maybe I am a little bit, but I don't think they do this every month. Okay, the next meeting is March. Okay. Wait, no, that's 2022. 2022, so yeah, gonna... the next... No, the next meeting is the end of January or early February, then March. All right, I'm going to say March. Okay, but they yeah, do... there's, no, like, there's no April. I... How about yeah, this? They is, do... This is a weird schedule. Well, well, we could see what... what... Hold on, let's just see what, what, people are, what the probabilities are. Uh, CME FedWatch tool. I'm saying that February 1st meeting, that's it. Fed's done hiking. All right, so it's February and March. Okay, so they go, yeah, I didn't think it was every month. Okay, they go February 50. Uh, and then 25 March, and then they're done. By the, by the way, there's, there's three more inflation prints in between there. What if inflation is at 5% by then? 4%. Could be. All right. Uh, moving on. Eric Balchun has tweeted, by BTFD, which stands for by the bleeping dip, is finally dead. By the freaking dip. By the freaking dip. Okay. Uh, Tom Serafagus wrote this article. This is interesting. ETF investors have stopped chasing the worst performing equity strategies, hitting at hinting at an end to the buy the dip approach that fueled rallies. Duh, 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 duh. Flows have varied widely among ETFs this year when broken down by performance deciles. The worst performing 10% of equity ETFs have outflows exceeding 11 billion, while the top two deciles have taken in $140 billion combined. I'm going to, we've got this uh, with this ARC stuff later in the doc. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move this up right now. Jeffrey Patak had a tweet showing uh, the percent of US stock funds that ARC innovation has outperformed or outlasted since inception. And starting in 17, it was 100%. And they went on a sick run. Did you see this chart? Yes, yeah, for the much money they brought in? The, no. How They outperformed. The outperformance. Oh, the outperformance. Okay, yes. So they outperformed every other fund in existence from, from their inception through 2017 to 2022. I can't remember. 21. I can't, it's hard to see where that stops. Anyway, it's been a, it's, it's been a crazy run. However, uh, needless to say, we're on the other side of that. And this is not a, this is not a joke. Somebody tweeted Kathy Wood doing a TikTok, unless it was like one of those deep fakes. Did you see the Morgan Freeman thing? Yeah. I saw, I don't know. I, uh, I don't know what to think about those. I, I just feel like everyone is going to have to like not believe anything anymore. You have no the, reaction to that? You have no reaction? That, that video didn't blow your face off? It's pretty, it, no, it's pretty cool. Here's the thing. I, I, I want to like recant, I want to change my AI take from a couple weeks ago a little bit. It's not that I don't believe AI is going to be like this crazy thing. I'm just sick of trying to get ahead of trends. I just, I want to, I'm sick of like talking about what's going to happen in the future and I'm just going to wait until it happens. It's happening, dude. I, I really don't like this take of yours. It's happening. It's right, literally happening. It's right in front of your face. What are you talking about? But how is, how is how has an AI chatbot changed your life? It's happening. It's here. I know it's I know it's here. But like, what has it done besides people putting out tweets and making funny? Ha ha! Look what I did to the AI chatbot. What else has it done? Be, like, I mean, besides, it, I it mean, makes it I, easier I for like college kids it's to, weird to, to like copy this. essays. I'm not this pooping. A, I'm just saying I'm not going to do anything until it actually impacts me personally. Okay. Um, That's what well, I, I, don't I, I don't know what that means. I'm, I'm like a middle aged man now, and I'm just stop. I'm stop caring about what's going to happen in the future. <laughs> So there's so this so, is the like get off my lawn take. I I don't care until it really impacts me. Okay, so we'll throw this in the YouTube video for viewers. There's a video of a dude talking on like the lower pane, and on the upper pane, it's Morgan Freeman. I am not Morgan Freeman. He's Morgan Freeman is mimicking exactly what this guy is saying in real time, and it's Morgan Freeman's voice, and it is insane. Is like. The ramifications for this are pretty mind bending, but anyway. So but Kathy my point is, that just no one's going to trust anything anymore. That's my point. Oh, or if you're if you're smart, you're not going to until you like yeah verify it, twelve it, times. And we don't have an abundance of trust these days, so that's that's great. Right. Uh, all right. So Kathy would really and truly, if this was not a bot or an, uh, some uh, AI simulation, she said, "We believe that the market cap associated with truly disruptive innovation will go from seven trillion now." 
to $210 trillion in the next eight to 10 years. That's a 30 fold increase. Now, I don't, I don't, I don't really love to like talk badly about people directly. Uh, and I'm, but this is, this is really, this is crazy talk. Well, here's this the is, thing. This, this is crazy talk. So in 10 years, to go from seven to two hundred ten trillion dollars would imply forty one percent compound annual growth rates. That would jump to forty six percent if it happens in nine years, and fifty three percent compounded annual growth rate if it happens in eight years. There's no way that there's no this is this is impossible. No, you, know, you know how it happens? How AI? <laughs> well, that's gotcha. what. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this is impossible. Could you could you really believe this? Here's the thing, though. During a bull market, these kind of things sound smart, and during no, a bear don't. market, they sound no, they crazy. Don't. No, they don't. No, when but she... more people more people are willing to like suspend disbelief during okay. a bull market than a bear market. And during a bear market, everyone goes, "What are you nuts?" And in a no, bull market, I'll, some people go, "Well, I said a lot of people called out her. Well, yeah, her Tesla ba- uh, base case at two trillion. Bear ca- no." Bear case two trillion. I think base was five. Whatever. You can't talk like this. <laughs> Apparently, when you stop, when people just, when you get so wildly successful and you have no one telling you no anymore, you just say whatever you want. Apparently, these days, I think that's what we've learned these last couple of years is that once you reach a certain point of success and wealth, no one's going to tell you no anymore. So you just say wild crap and hope something works. I think that's where we. That's the stage of society we're at. I don't, I don't love it. Don't love it. Um, Nate Rossi with a wild data point. Record $1.5 trillion gap between money flowing into ETFs and out of mutual funds this year. So ETFs had inflows of $588 billion. Most of that was uh, stocks and bonds. Mutual funds had outflows of $950 billion. Most of that or the majority of that was bond funds. So you're saying that what accounts for the difference? Is that you're asking? Uh, why is there, no, th- why is there no, more think- money coming out of mutual funds than going into ETFs? Is that what you're asking or not? No, I th- no I'm not asking. I think, I think we know. Oh. This is what Eric Balchunas has been saying for years, that a bear market is going to be really bad for active management, even though a lot of uh, this has been a good year for active. But no, People my point t- is that more money came out of mutual funds than went into ETFs, so that there's a big, huge oh, gap where, there. So where the money? Oh, uh, money market funds. Yeah. Also, I, I think a lot of it, a lot of it, I think this is probably going to continue. There's going to be a gap for a long time. Boomers are going to be spending their money eventually. Some of them are going to have to just sell and people are going to be selling stocks. Yeah, but, but that's going to be gradual. That's, I think the reason for this specifically is cash. That it's very, it. I think it's very easy. Uh, so the Wall Street Journal did an article talking about uh, the wild year that was. It, the headline was individual investors hanging out and on wild year for stocks. Uh, and this is, this is catnip for Ben and I. So, Brian Wilkinson. They obviously interviewed regular people for this. <laughs> yeah. Brian Wilkinson, 60 years old, said he has seen worse in the markets. He witnessed the 1987 stock market crash, remained invested after the attacks of September 11, 2001, and wrote out the 2008 financial crisis. The market always bounced back. Uh, with inflation high, he still thinks he has a better shot at earning high returns from stocks and bonds. Never a big spender on such things as eating out or entertainment. Mr. Wilkinson has continued contributing cash to his church and stashing away money toward retirement funds. This year, he increased his exposure to stocks to roughly 70% of his portfolio, paying down the mortgage on his home, giving, uh, has given Mr. Wilkinson, who lives near Nashville, Tennessee, extra firepower to keep investing. Now, here's the, the quote from Mr. Wilkinson. Stocks are really the only game in town to ultimately beat inflation. Still watching his investments, Tumble has been trying. Quote, it's painful, but it's the mis- uh it's the mistakes people make in the downturns that hurt people the most. You know what, Mr. Wilkinson? I could not agree more. This, That's a pretty good take. This is this is a this is a, a a take that is tried and true. This man, way to go. This man, Mr. Wilkinson, is staying the course. He's probably, if he's done what he says he's done, which has remained invested over the last thirty odd years. Guess what? This man has seen this and worse. And has seen the the downs and the ups and uh, kudos to Mr. Wilkinson. My only my He's only advice right. for Mr. Wilkinson. My only advice: spend a little money eating out and ha- having some entertainment. Enjoy yeah. yourself a little bit. There's, there's good there's good uh, fried you save chicken. Save for thirty years. Spend some of that money. Is there good fried chicken in Tennessee? Has to be spicy. Is that like the Nashville oh, yeah, chicken yeah, sandwich? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. That's right. 
one bite for me and I'm heartburn for a week. Well, I cannot oh, eat spicy stuff. We had, uh, the reason why that, that was, why I said uh, fried chicken, I couldn't remember where it came from. You're right, Ben. When we go to a, uh, uh, Mexico, remember we had that, the Nashville spicy chicken taco? Oh yeah. Very spicy. spicy. Good. Very good. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't do spicy. All right. Again, kudos to Mr. Wilkinson doing it right. Uh, so Vanda Research, who we've we've mentioned on the show before, they I don't know how they do it, but they track retail flows, and people are buying the snot out of Tesla. This is the retail. most retail money going in. It's yeah. all tech stocks. People still believe in tech stocks, I guess. The net retail purchases now. This data is, I think, from a week ago or so, but a lot of money going into Tesla. What is Tesla down now? Sixty percent from the highs. It's the biggest drawdown since they went public, like by a lot and a market cap d- d- destruction. Forget about it. Right. For a lot of these companies, obviously, but yeah. Okay. So it, it hasn't quite round trip yet, but it's, it's getting there. So yeah, 64% from the highs. We're going to talk in a little bit about stocks that are at their March, 2020 lows. Um, we spoke about stocks. Oh, wait, hang on. Yeah. So in the last three years, Tesla has had two 60% declines. It did? In that th- two, well, in the, in the, uh, pandemic was down 60%. Oh, I didn't realize so that. So what do you think the total return is for sitting through two 60% declines? Well, I know, it, the whole time? I know it was up 10x in 2021. So I'm, I'm so uh, the, what's the three-year return for Tesla? It's still up 440% yeah. despite two 60% drawdowns. Yeah. Just a t- tad bit of volatility there. Um, all right. I, I apologize because I don't know who I'm taking this from. I have these charts. I can't read the print because my eyes are busted. I saw this in an email, and they had some good charts in here. We talked about the foam. Credit to you for thinking about the sources here. I'm very sensitive you, to you sources. Don't, you don't want to get source shamed. No, no. I give credit where credit is due. Um, we spoke about the foam being wiped off the top of this market. Total market cap of Russell 3000 members with a 20x price to sales ratio. It looks like it was like 450 down to 180. Ben, is that roughly right? A 60% decline? Yeah. And it's almost round trip to 2019 levels. So we had a huge spike in 2020 and 2021, and now it's getting back to where oh boy. it Tesla's was. Tesla's down a three and a half percent at the open. Oof, oof, oof. Um, other good charts. Uh, the relative valuation of the all country world index XUS versus US. They're looking at the valuation, a blend of price to earnings, price to book, price to cash flow, price to free cash flow. And it's as low as it's been at any time over the last, uh, I don't know, 25 years or so. The hard part about relative valuations is we've probably been talking about this since 2016. True. And it keeps going lower. Very true. I However, mean, eventually that, that, that's going to like, there's going to be a, is it a slingshot or a, a coiled spring? We've had this discussion before. Uh, call it what you want. We, all, we, we, all we, know, right. we know what you're talking about. Um, so you combine that with the fact, look at this chart of the dollar. You combine that with the blow off top in the U S dollar, we could be set up for a run of international stocks, which seems hard to believe. But if we are on the other side of growth versus value, uh, and the U S dollar pulls back, it is very easy to see a year finally in which U S stocks underperform international stocks by more than a little it's possible, which no one is positioned for going into going into any of the less, it was really hard to envision a scenario where U.S. stocks underperform, uh, right? Because you would think in a bull market, U.S. stocks do better, and in a bear market, they do less bad. Possible that 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 is no longer the case. Yeah, that makes sense. I want to talk about the Fed and inflation a little bit. So, Powell, again, I mentioned in the opener, Powell said, we're not going to consider that, meaning changing the Fed's 2% inflation target under any circumstances. Now, here's what here's my question for you. Do you I don't think the him. Fed under any circumstances? You, why would he back himself to a corner that way? Is that an actual quote? Yes, that's this is from uh, Fed Woj. Um, do you think the Fed is basically lying about their forecast right now just because they don't want the markets to rally? But does that? But to your point about Ooh. backing yourself into a corner, don't they like lose more credibility if they if they pound the table? We're not going to change this, and then they change it in twelve months, but. Doesn't it kind of feel like here, the Fed is okay. lying about their forecast just because they, you know, it's like a parent lying to a child. You know, in, uh, in Willy Wonka, where he says to Charlie, I can't remember the exact end, but he like tells Charlie to get out of here that whatever. 
And then at the end, he hugs him and says, like, sorry, I had to, I had to do it to make sure that you were true. Maybe that's what the Fed is doing. It kind of feels, I mean, I know some that, people that's say- a, That's a decent hypothesis. Some people say, listen, don't fight the Fed, you idiots. They're telling you exactly what they're going to do. And I have some sympathy for that argument, but I also feel like maybe they know it's a psychology game. And the Fed knows if we back off of this a little bit, the markets are going to take off and it's going to ruin everything well, we, we're trying we, to do here. I, I was speaking about this, I don't know, three months ago. Like, I think the reason why he was talking tough is because they're so close to accomplishing their target. And I don't mean accomplishing, I don't mean getting to 2%. I just mean crushing inflation. And the minute they start to ease up on the rhetoric a little bit, the market flies undoing a lot of the work that they've done. And so I think, I, I think you're right. It's, 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 a lot of this is psycho psychological. We've talked about their projections before, but they, they, they say that their projection for the inflation, the unemployment rate, which is 3.7% right now, their projection for 2023 is 4.6, 2024 is 4.6, and 2025 is 4.5. I, feel, I wish they would just say, we don't know. Yeah. You know what? We don't know. Yeah. Because they're, also they're, the Fed funds rate for that is 5%, 4%, and 3%. And I'm sorry, but if, if the Fed had the ability to keep the unemployment rate, if they had it to let it go up 1% and keep it there for three years, they really would be the Wizard of Oz. Like, they, they can't do that. So they should just, I wish they would just say, like, we, we really don't know. Okay? And, and that's as far as we're going to go. Because those projections are essentially worthless. All right, here's one more from... From the Fed, which is kind of crazy because I looked, there was a magazine cover five years ago showing robots basically doing everyone's job and showing people on the corner like begging for money, saying that the robots are going to take our job. This is 2017. Now it says, this is Powell from his press conference. It feels like we have a structural labor shortage out there where, you know, 4 million fewer people, a little more than 4 million who were in the workforce available to work than there's demand for a workforce. So the fact that there's a strong labor market, you know, means that companies will hold on to workers. Basically saying, he said there's a structural labor shortage. And guess what that means? We need to let more people in this country. That's the solution to all of our ills right now in the labor market and the Fed and inflation. Let in 3 million people right now who are willing to work these jobs that apparently some other people don't want to work. Is that not the solution that would, is that the Fed can't do that, obviously. So they're doing what they can. But isn't that what he's more or less saying to Congress? Let more people in the country? Yes. And obviously it's probably not going to happen. Okay. Uh, I think that's right. Uh, before we move off this topic, somebody threw out a chart of central banks' number of rate hikes per year around the globe. This is the year. Oh, wow. Yeah, you're right. 200 hikes, a sample of 38 central banks. It is, it is interesting to be living in this moment of time like where we have entered a completely new investing landscape. I'm not saying that the bull market is – you know, the secular bull market is dead and buried and, you know, reasons to be scared, but it's just, this is a fundamentally different investment. But this is the hard part about, I've like Howard Marks had his letter last year, last week, where he basically said, this is a new regime. Yes. It's higher inflation. And, and I could see that scenario, but I could also see that the scenario where we look back and we say, this was a one-time rise in rates to kill off inflation. And then we kind of went back to where we were not, not zero, but just lower bound. 2%, 3%, whatever. And maybe it's not quite a new environment. It's just, it's not zero. Yeah. But, but even not zero is a new environment. Well, but, but think about how much the pandemic forced our hand for, for going like beyond zero in, in certain ways. Like I think things would have been way more normal had the pandemic not happened. I think the pandemic made it force the hand of everyone on this. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so we talked about oh, goods uh, versus... Uh, just on that point, like Lindsay was talking about this. We work should have been the top. Right, yes. And then the pandemic happened and SoftBank, Tiger, Zoom deals, like free money. It, it... Absent the pandemic, we don't get the blow off top that we had. Definitely not. Robinhood, right? Reddit, none of that happens without the pandemic. None of it. Right. I, and I don't know if you've been paying attention. The the meme stocks, no one really talks about them anymore. AMC is back down to four something a share. A Bed it Bath is, and Beyond, Bed Bath and Beyond, the long term chart looks like the VIX. It just has like these crazy spikes and crashes. It's under three bucks. AMC is down ninety two percent from the highs. GameStop's down seventy seven percent. These are the kind of things that you only hear about them when they're doing good. Once they start doing bad, you never hear about it anymore. That's right. People, people painting AMC on their garage doors and whatever they were doing. All right, 
Last week, we mentioned goods versus services in the economy and how the economy is different than the stock market. Callie Cox from eToro, friend of the show, sent us over a chart that she created. It's money spent on goods versus money spent on services. I've never seen it like this before, but you can see the they're both increasing over time, but the money spent on services is is going way up. Can we just mention that you have your, how old is your son now, three? Look at this guy, come here. Come here. <laughs> he's being very good during know, a podcast. I don't even know what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> he's got treats. He, he came and chopped two muffins. All right, go play. He's a... This kid is an angel. He's being very good. Yeah. Uh, all right, so what is, Ka- what is Kylie showing in this chart? Just money spent on goods versus money spent on services, both increasing, but services looks like it's increasing a lot more. And it's just to the point of the stock market not being the economy. I'd never seen it broken out like this before. Very cool chart. All right. This is for a headline from Bloomberg. Highest interest rate in, in 15 years are derailing the American dream. And my whole takeaway from seeing this is there is never going to be a perfect economy. It's, it's not going to happen because 12 months ago, this would have read, Highest inflation in 40 years is derailing the American dream. Of course. The, Josh had this perfect post about the economy. The economy is, is made up of winners and losers. It can't be any other way. And when everyone is winning, Josh's point, when everyone is winning, an economy ceases to function normally. But in the 2010s, it was rising inequality and slow growth and uh, slow wage growth and savers are being punished. And now it's rates are, so it's like, the thing is, it's never going, something is always going to be killing the American dream, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Uh, just one thing on crypto that I thought was interesting and, and probably the least surprising thing ever. JP Morgan did a report showing that the share of the population that had ever transferred funds into a crypto related account tripled during the pandemic, 3% prior to 2020 to 13%. Uh, And they've got a nifty chart showing that the majority of new crypto users made their first transactions in a set of days spanning less than five months, all of which coincide with a trailing monthly price change exceeding 25%. In other words, the TLDR, and look at this chart, is um, in crypto especially, and Whoa. certainly true for other assets, but crypto especially, uh, people were price chasers, uh, which at some point will happen again. If you have a behavioral psychology college course or teaching, you show this chart. Yeah. Price rises, people come in. Price falls, not as many people come in. Real estate. Nick Maines tweeted, home sales are down nearly 15% month over month in Detroit, um, but that's not leading to much, by the way, of price relief. And I think we had mentioned this, that like there's a gigantic gap between where buyers are at price-wise and where sellers are at. And I think sellers move very, very slowly because guess what? Unless you need to move, you're not panic selling your house, right? right. Like that's, you don't need to be a, a home expert to know that. Jonathan Miller t- uh, quote tweeted. Said, These are limit is- orders, not market orders. There we go. This is a U.S. phenomenon. Chronically low inventory levels keeps a firmer base under prices than we have seen in other downturns. And I'm going to double down on my call that if mortgage rates continue to come down, activity is going to V. So it, it is interesting. He said this is a U.S. phenomenon. We get a lot of questions from international listeners who in our inbox saying, I'm going to be one of these people in Canada or Great Britain or whatever in Europe where my mortgage rates are going to reset in two years. So do you think that those mortgage rates resetting because they don't have fixed 30-year fixed rate mortgages, they reset every like two to five years, that the losses in other countries are going to be greater than the United States? Does that make sense? Because that, 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 at that point, you don't have you don't have the appeal of staying in a 3% mortgage anymore. House. Because Because then you are a forced seller? Yeah, because then it doesn't it doesn't matter. The mortgage rate's going to be the same at one house to the next. So it's there's a more more of a clearing of the market. Yeah, that sounds market really scary price. to be to be tied to the whims of Oof. No, yeah. I All right. Why, so why this can't, is why we'll, can't why can't they just be like, "You know what? Well, we'll do a 15 year." Right. We're going to lock you in. The Wall Street Journal had a great piece on why this housing downturn isn't like the last one. So they say a 28% decline in home prices between 2006 and 2009 sent the value of some 11 million homes below their mortgage balances, meaning debt was more than equity, which was widespread defaults and a collapse of the financial system and recession that everyone knows. Home prices this time would have to fall between 40 and 45% from their peak to put the same proportion of mortgaged homes underwater today, according to core logic analysis. All right. 
Now imagine you are you have a DeLorean. You can get it up to 88 and travel back, but you can only go back to 2010. Okay? You go back to 2010, and 2010 Michael is reading Michael Lewis's The Big Short. Like you're reading about all the crap that happened in the in the real estate market. Imagine showing this. 2010 chart to your- Michael was a very depressing Michael. Okay, that was not a good year for you. It huh? was a terrible year. It was balding. It was, it was all, all, all bad things were happening to me. Wait, what year did you bick it finally? I don't know if I ever told this story. It was 2013. So I had been begging my girlfriend, now wife, to shave my head. And listen, balding is like very traumatic, especially for a young man. It's not something that like, oh, no big deal. No, it's everything. It's like the only thing. It was horrible. I never took my hat off. It was just, it was terrible. Um, and so I had been asking her to just let me shave my head. And she was like, you know, not now, not now, wait till the wedding, which is, which is fair. But when I finally did shave my head, I had no idea what my head looked like. I don't know if there was like moles or, <laughs> or craters. Yeah. I had, you know, I had never seen my head before. And so she was out and I took the buzzer to my head and I fa- and I was like, thank God. Like I, I was just like, okay, I don't look like Frankenstein. And I FaceTimed her and she's like, I'm like, not bad. But she goes, yeah, not bad. Got to go. And I was like, what? That's it? (laughs) Got to go. What do you? Anyway, uh, but I- You do have a nice shaved head. Thank you. I finally did shave it, shave it in 2015, like with the razor blade. Okay. But again, back to Ben's imagined scenario. You got Doc Brown's DeLorean. You take this chart of the housing bubble and then what happens next to equity and debt and show it to yourself in 2010. There's no way you believe this happened where you see that difference between equity and debt in the housing bubble in, in what happened now. That's wild. It blows wild. it off the chart, yeah. right? Yeah. No way you would have ever thought this would happen back then. Yeah. Obviously we know the reasons why, but it's this chart to me is just absolutely insane in yeah, a, a decade one. of crazy charts. That is a good one. Um, let's skip this private market stuff. I want to keep it moving. Um, you know, prior to prior to Elon buying Twitter and going absolutely insane, I don't think I really had like strong opinions on him. I, you know, like obviously a great showman, a great uh, um, and and had done brilliant things in his career, like the miracle of of doing what he did with Tesla when the cards were stacked against him, and doing what he did. His Ashley Vance prior- book about Tesla. Yeah. Making it through the financial crisis, honestly, it was is one of the better books I read. It's a it's an amazing story. Yeah, so he he had done some you know brilliant brilliant things, and uh, but now it's like uh, it's 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 uh, it's a train wreck. I mean, it's an absolute train wreck. And if I was a Musk fanboy, and listen, they've been treated very well as Tesla shareholders, I'd be beyond livid. And it looks like the tide is turning on him. Now, how could it not? I'd be livid with what he's doing and how he's behaving. So just some of the stuff that happened on Twitter this week. um, And I'm not even talking about uh, like activity on Twitter, like the platform, just literally what, how he's behaving. So it's, it's just, it's, he's, he's in over his head. um, And he finally tweeted, should I step down as head of Twitter? I will abide by the results of this poll. And then he said, actually, only Twitter blue subscribers will be allowed to vote in policy related polls. Then earlier in the week, I can't keep track of the timeline. Earlier in the week, he's taking journalists off Twitter. He took Lynette Lopez off Twitter for reasons that are uh, not exactly clear. And he had been doing nasty shit to Lynette for years and he just removed it from the platform. And the idea that he bought this for free speech is really hilarious when he's removing people. He's removing journalists that have said nasty things about him. Uh, what else did he do? Uh, he said, oh, you cannot, uh, talk about other social media platforms on Twitter, free speech. What are you talking about? And the list included Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, whatever. And conspicuously absent was TikTok because we know the relationship that Tesla has with China. So it's just, it's just awful to watch. Uh, Unfortunately, so, he's he's going to alienate a lot of Twitter people to be like, fine, I'm out. And that's the thing that's upsetting to me is like, I still use the service. I like the service for getting news and analysis. And, and if he alienates enough people to leave, he's gonna, it, he's just going to run this thing into the ground. I, it, it'll still be fine and people will still show up. I, I, I'm i of the opinion that like, it's either Twitter or bust. There's, there's no other platform that's going to come along and do the same thing. 
So right? I, I don't think going to another platform is going, there's nothing's going to step in and fix it. If, unless Facebook said we're going to do a text only version of Instagram, I don't, I just don't see another Twitter happening. I think I it's Twitter think. or nothing. Um, maybe there's like micro Twitters where it's like, you know what, this whole bringing everyone right. together thing. I just, I want to live in an echo chamber. I don't know that, I don't know if that's healthier either, but I think maybe people, yeah, people but that's, don't, I mean, that's, that's slack done with the nastiness. Uh, and then there was this thing where a lot of the journalists who were suspended somehow were able to get out to spaces because there was some sort of breakage of the code. I don't know how it works. And so he shut down spaces. I mean, this is an absolute train wreck. He's trying to raise money. Now the bonds are selling at, I don't know, 50 cents on the dollar. Uh, Paul Graham found somebody tweeted Paul Graham, founder of Y Combinator and someone who was supportive of Elon Musk since the Twitter takeover announced he's taking a break from Twitter and suggested people can find his Mastodon account on his website. He was banned a few hours later. I cannot believe it. Again, he bought Twitter because he thought uh, free speech uh, police wokeness had run amok. Let's say uh, we, you and I were talking about this offline the other day. Let's say he gets an audit and someone has to va value his $55 billion, $54 billion investment. That's down what? 90% right now? Well, what's Snap worth? I don't know. Good question. I think tw I'm making this up. Twitter's worth $3 billion right now. Probably. But I think the biggest thing is it's impossible to be that successful and powerful and famous and rich and still hold on to self-awareness. I, I think that's, and that's, you, the, that's the big lesson. You can't be self-aware anymore when you, have that, when you have that much success and power at such a young age. If you, and if you're still supporting Elon Musk... I mean, well, obviously it's become political and that's the bad thing is that like, if you are against something he does and it has to, you be on this team or this team and that's, that's the thing. How you can't, is this even people, political? He's just behaving like an asshole. I know. I, what does this have to do with politics? Because everything has to do with politics these days, unfortunately, everything is viewed through the lens of politics and you can't just view something on its own. Without His behavior being, is that of a sociopathic child. This is crazy behavior. And you could say that he's done great things in, in other areas of his life and also acknowledge that this is a f***ing train wreck. Okay. It, um, it is kind of, it is crazy though that, that landing a rocket ship is probably easier than running Twitter. It, it, at least for him. That's equations. Which, they can figure yeah. that stuff out. Uh, but what's interesting is that uh, there, there was an article in the information as well. I think, I can't remember if it was the Times of the Journal uh, that people are like, you know what? <laughs> This guy's onto something in terms of how he, not how he's running Twitter, but in terms of just going in and cleaning out the fat. So uh, here's the lead to the article. Some might call Elon Musk's leadership style toxic. Others consider it heroic. It's certainly influential. Somebody, uh, a quote, if Elon did it, we should do it. Describing startup leaders' perspective on Musk's cutthroat approach to job cuts. What we saw with Musk and Twitter is going to be commonplace. Uh, I have to, here, these are all quotes. I have to imagine founders are thinking, oh shit. This guy had to like go 60 to 70% of the team and the plane is still flying. Do we really need to have that many people? And I think that firing people like that is obviously um, really tough for those involved. But yeah. I think maybe there is something to this, that there is a lot of overemployment in tech well, companies. Yeah, tech, tech people obviously overhyped. But the thing is, Elon Musk obviously doesn't really care about the recourse from his actions. And a lot of other people do. So I think he, that's the thing with him being like a sociopath. He can do that and not really care how it impacts people because that's that's like the sort of leader he is. Some other people wouldn't be able to do rules such an iron fist, I well, feel like. There's also, it also depends on the size of the team. There's a, there's a big difference between a company with, you know, 27 employees that only needs 20 versus a company with 5,000 employees that only needs 1,500. But if, if you're that size and you let go 60 to 70% of your workforce, doesn't that poison like everyone's uh, – Exactly. <laughs> Everyone's that's, like, that's, oh, oh shit, am I next? Yeah, do I still want to work here? All right, so Ben, okay. we were talking about this yesterday. Companies that are making, that are round tripping to the March 2020 lows. Walt Disney, I know I said Walt Disney. Uh, Disney is where it was in the at the lows of March 2020, which is pretty freaking nuts considering all the success of Disney Plus and where would Disney be without Disney Plus, those conversations in 2020, 21. Um, and then of course Iger said, and with his, with as busy as their park stuff has been like, they're raking in the money there. Yeah. Iger said, and all it right, it doesn't matter. I'm back. Get out of my way. I have, I still have a lot of stock. I'm losing a lot of money. I'm back. Uh, Amazon also back to March, 2020 lows. When does Jeff Bezos come back to run the show? Amazon was only down 22% from the highs during the pandemic. It was easily one of the best performing stocks. 
than besides like some of the Moderna and that stuff. But he's only, what did we say yesterday? 58, 58. or something? He's not that old. So I wouldn't doubt it. If, I, if they're on 70%, if he comes back, I would, I would bet on a, like a Kalshi, hook this up. I would bet on like a long shot. Uh, I don't know what the odds I would need. 15 to 1. Maybe that's even too high. I don't think high. it's that much of a yeah, long I, shot. I, I, don't, I, I, would, I would actually bet on lower odds than that. Uh, Bezos coming back in the next uh, 12 to 24 months. How about this? You put up this chart of Amazon and Disney side by side here, top to bottom. Amazon should buy Disney. If they really want Prime Amazon to- should buy Disney. How's that? What's Disney's market cap? It's got to be. Is it, a, is it under 150? I know Amazon's down to like 850, I think. Disney is... Yeah, 160. 160, a little less than 160. Amazon should buy them. Let's look at the debt. Uh, it's an enterprise value of 200, 200 billion dollars. Okay, I mean that that's not happening, but interesting nonetheless. All right, uh, the transcript pulled some stuff from Microsoft. Going into the pandemic, we're 20 million monthly average users. Our most recent public statement on Teams has been we're talking about Teams has been 270 million monthly active users. About six months ago, we finally saw the number of minutes spent in chat and Teams surpass the number of minutes that people spend in Outlook. How about that? That's another thing that's never going away. Another fundamentally th- thing that's been fundamentally changed by the pandemic. By the way, I, we, can't talk, you, I can't talk on the phone anymore. I never like talking on the phone. As you know, I'm not really a small talker. But if I'm going to talk to somebody, I much prefer doing a Zoom. Okay. See, I was going to go the other way. I would much prefer a conference call like the old days. Okay. I, 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 have to look at everyone. I want to look at somebody when I talk to them. Every call that we have now is a, is a zoom. I, I, I'd be happy if someone sent me a conference call line with a passcode. Not me. I want if uh, I just want to look at somebody when I talk to them. Um, this is from uh, the LinkedIn CEO pre pandemic around 1% of all jobs posted on LinkedIn were remote. As of today, the number is 14%, but that's not the fascinating part. What's fascinating is north of 50% of all job applications on a daily basis on LinkedIn go to that 14% of remote jobs. That's Everyone a good one. Wants those. I didn't realize LinkedIn still had a CD since micro, or CEO since Microsoft owns them. Uh, so I thought that was very interesting. All right, I've got a, th- a few random observations of the week, Ben. Uh, I, need to, I need to hear about this bald guy with earmuffs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, should we start there? Yes. So I took the train yesterday. It was freezing. It's like very cold. And on the train platform, you're... I don't know, 50 feet in the air. So it's extra windy. It's cold. It's cold. I bundle up. I put on my winter hat. I put on my hood. Well, that's the best part about being a bald. You can wear a hat and it doesn't mess your hair Fantastic. up. Fantastic. It's the best. I feel for those poor, full-headed bastards who have that nice, beautiful quaff that they can't get it ruined and they need to put- I wear a hat and my hair is just, it's- Yeah, you, I need, got to, like you need to put the earmuffs on. But I saw a full-headed bald with earmuffs on and I, I almost- Wanted to tap him on the shoulder. You should have said something like, "Hey, man, what's going on?" I, I need, I need to, I need to hear more. What are you, uh, <laughs> what are you doing here? Why would you expose your entire dome to the uh, brutal cold and just cover your ears? It's true. Does all the head that uh, gets released through your head get released through your ears? That's true. You got to keep the head warm, head and feet, right? Uh, okay, so. Uh, it is funny when, when so uh, when you like when you're putting toys together for kids, you're basically an elf. Is that your? That's yeah, it. That's I'm, like so. Kobe got like a big Mario Kart. Kobe got a big Mario Kart. He's obsessed with Mario. He had a big Mario Kart thing. Oh, so he's gonna love that movie. Yeah, he can't wait. He got a big Mario Kart thing where it's got like an on switch and there's like things that spin to propel the the thing. It's pretty. It's pretty great. He actually can ride it. Yeah. So. So I felt like a, a Hanukkah elf putting that thing together. And in the morning, I woke up to it being on. I'm like, how the heck did you figure this thing out? Because once you pass a certain marker, the flagpoles go down until you're the winner. And it's like pretty sophisticated. And he said, Daddy, I saw this video on YouTube like a couple months ago. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. And lastly, I just want to make a comment on some unintended consequences. So for example, I'm talking about Starbucks. I don't know how much of their of their uh, coffee is now done through the mobile app. It feels like it's got to be over 50%. So now, at certain points of the day, it's faster to just go in and order. It's faster to go in and wait online because oftentimes there's a backlog on the mobile stuff. 
the new thing is, and this is not really new, but it's new around here, is there's a store on Summers Highway, a Starbucks drive through that's new, and it is causing traffic jams because people are so lazy that they're spilling out onto the highway. And I'm thinking, who are these maniacs? Like, would you really wait in your car for 20 minutes or uh, however no, I, long I it takes? I feel like five cars in a drive through for me is max. And I'm, nope, I'm going to the next place or I'm out. You either go inside think or you go. How, think of how much, mon- how much time I've saved by not drinking coffee and not going to Starbucks. I've got so many extra minutes in my life. What are you doing with them? I don't know. Uh, all right, let's talk about Carvana real quick. This is, there's a lot of uh, contenders for chart of the pandemic, but this is up there. So it had a market cap at its peak of $31 billion. It's under 500 million bucks right now. Jeez. I remember there was a, there was a story in Bloomberg saying that like the father and son who created it were worth like $20 billion or something, right? Yeah. So it's got a, it's got 47% of the float is short. Is that right? There's a chart from Ihor Dusanuski. I'm. I'm likely butchering that. I apologize. Nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> but it is heavily shorted. I don't know anything. I don't know how this company avoids bankruptcy. Car dealership guy who's a good follow did a whole thread on Carvana. And he said, Carvana website website visitors are down 45% month over month. You don't just lose 45% of your web traffic without shutting off your marketing. This tells me that they are likely in severe cost cutting and downsizing mode. And people I are keep saying hearing like, their podcast ads, though. Why are they still yeah. doing podcast ads? Well, that's I guess maybe that's already paid for. How much of the rise in used car prices was driven by Carvana? Oh, right. They were. That could be. You know, it's at an all-time low. Airbnb. We were probably talking about Airbnb as the next potential trillion-dollar company, and I'm still bullish on Airbnb. But oof, not, not yeah. good. I own that one still. New all-time low. I'm just getting. Yeah, this is why I don't pick stocks. It's hard. It's fun, but hard. Okay. Uh, oh, last week we spoke about the odd, the the success of mutual funds, like whatever it was. I came out, I was like, that's actually pretty good. Well, Jeffrey Patak cleaned it up for us. He said, one quick clarification. The reason those success odds seem high is because it only accounts for funds that lived at least five years. It excludes those that die before hitting the five-year mark. So Most of the, and, and a lot of funds died. That should have been obvious to us, but oh well. All right. Uh, we both saw Avatar. What is it called? The Wave of the Water? Yeah. I saw it yesterday. Kids, kids were at the in-laws, and my wife and I, instead of going out to dinner date, decided to go see Avatar. It, uh, I really liked the first one. The first 45 minutes or so, I was a little worried. I'm like, this is kind of like the last one. And then it completely changed and went in a different direction. And the visuals of the movie are just absolutely stunning. It will, I don't know how they, how Cameron does it, but it was, it really was a spectacle. It was, it was, people are saying it's too long. It probably is too long, but it didn't feel that long when I was there. I, I, I'm pretty sure I only saw Avatar. I liked it. I really, I really liked it. I'm pretty sure I only saw Avatar once. I saw it on Blu-ray. It was the first movie I saw on Blu-ray, and like everyone else, I was completely blown away. And I, I've probably seen bits and pieces since, but it was so burned into my memory, that experience, that I never felt the need to revisit it. I remember exactly what happened. And so I saw it in, uh, I saw it in 3D, and uh, I texted you guys after that I, I felt like I was just watching Magic. Obviously, the I don't underwater know. Underwater stuff in 3D must have been awesome. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't know how how any movies are made, but this one in particular, the way that the car- the creatures looked, like the water coming off of them, and then being next to the humans, it was such a spectacle. It, absolutely, if you're even on the fence, yeah, it is too long. It definitely, there's no doubt about it. But it was so good. Um, and but 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 that's one that you have to see in the theater too. But paradoxically, I, I don't really need another. So they're saying that there's going to be three more. Like, I feel like this movie is such a, such an epic thing that I only, I think I can only take one every five years. Like, I don't. I'm definitely, I'm going to definitely watch them, but I'm, I'm curious to know what else there is, how much more meat is left in the bone. Yeah, I'm pretty good. You know, I'm pretty. I, th- I, I thought that the, the final fight scene, like the last hour of the oh, movie. It was incredible. It was, was just like not, it was an it was amazing, incredible. amazing fight scene. So, yeah, it was, it was so good. So I got, I got, uh, 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 tickets in Farmingdale. And Robin goes, oh, Farmingdale, because it was at 7.30. She's like, why? And I said, I, I was like, I, I, so I learned on Google Maps, and I saw it was 30 minutes away. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I guess I thought it was closer. And as I'm driving there, uh, it was only, it happened to only be 24 minutes away. And it's kind of interesting psychologically how a 24-minute drive felt like nothing. You anchored. <laughs> a 24-minute drive felt like nothing, but 30 minutes feels like the other end of the world. 
I do have one hot take from the movie. Yeah. Uh, Jake Sully and his wife, whatever, however you pronounce it, tough hang. Like, if you had to go on a double date with them like, oh, to dinner. four kids? Very tough hang. Well, no, just the two of them, yeah. because they're always arguing. Yeah. And mad at, they're always really mad and angry. S- uh, yeah, that's good. I like they were mad at their kids the whole movie. That's It'd a good be a point. tough hang. Uh, so Kate Winslet held her breath for over seven minutes in that movie? Did you I didn't see even know that? which one she was. She was the wife of the C. Okay, right. Whatever. Um, so when the movie, before the movie started, they showed like the 10 minute clip from Mission Impossible of him motorcycling off the bridge with the. Well, I didn't see that. I saw it on the internet though. Did you watch the whole thing? TC is amazing. <laughs> I can't wait for that movie. <laughs> uh, <laughs> lastly, awesome. uh, so I saw Seinfeld on Friday and uh, breaking, spoiler, he's good. Uh, he, he did amazing crowd work and he's just so relaxed and uh, it was it was very funny. There the you go. If you have a chance to see Jason, I felt he's, he's funny. All right. I loved, there was a two-part Fly on the Wall to Chris Farley tribute with Dana Carby and uh, David Spade. They had Sandler on. They had Kevin Nealon on. Chris they Rock? had John Lovitz on. Chris Rock. They had all these people just telling Farley stories. Okay. They had some of his family on, his brothers. It was so well done and everyone agreed like this is the funniest guy. All these funny people are like, no, no one is funnier than Farley and I totally agree. I loved it. Uh, our new show is The English on Amazon Prime. Easily the highest quality show on Amazon Prime I've ever seen. The it's a English. six part mini series oh, with Emily part? Blunt. I'm in. Oh, and I yes. love Emily Blunt. Say no more. Yeah, I don't I even care what Emily it's Blunt. about. I'm in. It's it's a western, but it's also kind of like far and away where they're trying to get land in the west in the late 1800s. It's it's you kind of have to work for it a little bit. They don't they don't like hold your hand for the plot, but by the time you get to the plot by like episode 4 and it all comes together, you're like, "Oh, and it's can I tell you something? really good Western scene. I saw Far and Away in the movie theater. I was seven years old. I have no idea what the movie was about. I can't remember. I know it was TC and Nicole Kidman, but I'm pretty sure I had no business seeing that movie. Probably not at that point. He was a bare knuckle, buckle, knuckle uh, uh, boxer, though, which is not bad. Uh, one more. Trapped in Paradise. Total, total 90s movie. Nicolas Cage, Dana Carvey, and John Lovitz. And it's a dumb plot. And for whatever reason, it's got a million 90s like that, guys. Wait, I've never and heard of this. Chris- where, Christmas where, one. Where do I see Trapped this? Trapped in Paradise. It was on Showtime anytime. Okay. If you got that. And it's it's a dumb plot from the nineties, but for some reason nineties movies just like they just get me. And I I great movie. Christmas, <laughs> snow, like uh, dumb plot, but I liked it. I, I mean these are John Lovett's Data Carvey and Nicolas Cage. It's like I never heard of this. Perfect I, yeah, perfect nineties Nicolas Cage. It's 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 pretty good. It's like a bank robbery movie, and there's a mobsters in it and a small town. It's great. All right, listen. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy New Year. We will obviously be with you through the end of the year because there's no breaks on Animal Spirits. So uh, if you're around, we'll see you next Wednesday. If you're taking the week off, enjoy. Thank you for listening. AnimalSpiritsPod at gmail.com.